This video is brought to you by Nebula and CuriosityStream. So, fun fact listeners, me and the Blade Runner franchise have been on an interesting journey for some time. I watched the original film, I think in the summer before college. I definitely rented it from my local library, and aside from the aesthetic, which I had already seen in works inspired by Blade Runner, the movie made almost no impression on me. My main memory of watching it was, in the final sequence when this character Roy Batty gives an extremely famous monologue about tears in the rain, my dad walked into the kitchen and started having a fairly loud conversation with my sister. I'm sure neither of them remember this, I tended to watch things at a low volume and hadn't yet learned to watch everything with captions, so I missed the entire speech. And much later learned I missed an extremely famous speech in cinema. Then in 2017, director Denis Villeneuve dropped Blade Runner 2049 and I saw it in theaters. Twice. And it really baked my noodle. So let's talk about Blade Runner 2049. Do you dream about being interlinked? What's it like to hold your child in your arms? Do you feel like there's a part of you that's missing? And do androids dream of electric sheep? All questions that are asked and may be answered by the Blade Runner franchise. And to talk about 2049, one must spend a bit of time talking about the original Blade Runner, directed by Ridley Scott, starring Harrison Ford. Depending on your level of film bro-ness, I suspect some of this won't be news to you, so I'll be quick. Sci-fi novelist and asshole with a funny name, Philip Kindred Dick, published Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep in 1968, just five years after publishing Man in the High Castle and attempting to push his third wife off a cliff in 1963. Many of his works will be familiar, at least by name. If you aren't a reader of his works, you've probably seen a movie or show based on one of his stories, like Man in the High Castle, Minority Report, Total Recall, A Scanner Darkly, and of course, Blade Runner. The film, which was released in 1982, is also generally cited as being one of the progenitors of what is now called the cyberpunk genre. The very brief summary is that Rick Deckard, played by Harrison Ford, is a former cop and Blade Runner who was brought out of retirement to kill, aka retire, replicants. Replicants are bioengineered robots that are nearly indistinguishable from humans, the androids of the original book's title. And one notable quality in replicants is that they have implanted memories. This will be important later. So Deckard is brought back into the LAPD to track down and kill four replicants. Nexus 6 models specifically. There's a guy he works with named Gaff, played by Edward James Olmos, who makes little origami creations. Just cuz. He also meets a replicant named Rachel, played by Sean Young, who he's also probably supposed to kill, but he doesn't because she's pretty. He does mostly kill the other four replicants, Leon, Zora, Pris, and most notably, serial murderer and weird bird holder Roy Batty, played tremendously by Rutger Hauer. He gives this really famous speech about tears and rain before he dies, and then the film ends on an ambiguous note as Deckard runs away with Rachel. It's too bad she won't live, but then again, who does? In the final moment, Deckard finds one of Gaff's origami creations, a unicorn, echoing Deckard's dream about a unicorn from earlier in the film, implying Deckard may be yet another replicant with implanted memories. The movie was, by all accounts, fairly difficult to make. I imagine that since half the cast spends 90% of this movie in varying degrees of wet, it couldn't have been fun to film. But notably, early previews of the film tested badly with audiences, and so the studio butchered the film. Rumor has it that Harrison Ford purposefully read the added voiceover as badly as possible so they wouldn't use it. Gaff had been there and let her live. Four years, he figured. He was wrong. There have been several versions since. I watched the final cut, which I think is generally agreed to be the truest version of the film. 
And when the film was released, it was not universally beloved. I mean, the studio recut of the film probably wasn't helping things, but Sheila Benson from the Los Angeles Times called it Blade Crawler. Still, the aesthetics and themes of the film were enough to make it an enduring classic of the sci-fi genre. Director Ridley Scott had wanted to make a follow-up film, but licensing disputes over the Philip K. Dick novel hindered him for many years. In 2011, Alcon Entertainment officially purchased the intellectual property from producer Bud Yorkin, and then actual plans for a sequel were set in motion. Ridley Scott was at one point set to direct the sequel film, but ended up having to step away to work on his 2017 film Alien Covenant. He remained with the film as an executive producer, and director Denis Villeneuve was brought on in his place. At the time of his hiring, he was still relatively an up-and-comer, but the studio Alcon Entertainment had a good working relationship with him from his first English-language feature film, Prisoners. I'm going to talk about Denis more later, but just know he had not yet dropped his first big hit, Arrival, or even the relatively mainstream Sicario, which came out in fall 2015, while Arrival was still in post-production and pre-production on Blade Runner 2049 started. So he was, by all accounts, an interesting pick. The screenplay was written by Michael Green and Hampton Fancher. Fancher also worked on the original Blade Runner screenplay, and was somewhat involved in getting the rights to Philip K. Dick's story option in the first place. He said in one interview with co-writer Michael Green, I was looking for a vehicle, and it was rather cold-blooded on my part, because that's what I'd been lacking in everything. I'd been trying, I didn't have through lines, I didn't have MacGuffins, I didn't have plots, and I was Antonini all the way. It was like, that's my way into wherever the gold is. It was that one thing, and that's all, and the idea that science fiction was going to become popular in the near future. And so, I didn't have any love of Dick at all. I was never a fan. And I just need to point out this exchange between the writers after that statement. I want that as a poll quote. You never had any love of Dick? Not penis or science fiction. There's time. <laughs> For the sequel film, it seems it started with Fancher and Ridley. I'm unclear on the specifics, but at some point there was a call and Fancher had some idea of a story structure in mind. Green, a recent collaborator with Scott who had worked on Alien Covenant as well as good movies like Logan, was brought on to co-write with Fancher, having more of a sci-fi background than his co-writer, who was more interested in the works of Raymond Chandler than Philip K. Dick. Fancher wrote a treatment of the film, which was handed to Michael Green, who turned it into the screenplay. Now, Fancher has said a couple different things about the genesis of the story across several interviews. In one interview, he said he'd written a short story about Kay, or kind of had Kay in his head before the first meeting with Ridley Scott, and he reportedly had Ryan Gosling in mind for that character from the get-go. Independently of that conversation, Michael Green also had Gosling in mind for the role. So let's do the rundown and start with Kay, played by Ryan Gosling. He's a replicant and a Blade Runner, which means he kills his own kind, and although he is definitionally a cop, to quote my friend Aranok, it's not his fault he was literally assigned cop at birth. Kay is actually a rather mild, passive character, in spite of the violence we sometimes see him do. And we can't talk about Kay without talking about Joy. Joy played by Anna de Armas in one of her breakout roles, is a mass-marketed AI. But our Joy, that we get to know in the film, is a remarkably layered character. A lot of her natural responses might be pre-programmed, but she's become her own person with agency. Her relationship with Kay, on the surface, looks like the pair are play-acting some 50s husband-and-wife fantasy, but there's a lot more going on there. We've got Kay's boss, Lieutenant Joshi, played by Robin Wright, She's a hard-edged character whose attempts at kindness are almost as awful as everything else she says and does. Real-life garbage person Jared Leto plays the fictional garbage person Neander Wallace, who runs the Wallace Corporation. The Wallace Corporation took the place of the Tyrell Corporation, who made the replicants in the first film. Wallace now makes replicants, bioengineers, weird bug food, builds AIs like Joy, and is, generally speaking, a total creep. His right-hand woman is a replicant named Love, played by Sylvia Hoegs. Love is fascinating because she really wants to be the best at what she's been made to do, and that perfection seems to make her kind of short-circuit sometimes. 
Mackenzie Davis plays a replicant sex worker named Mariette, who isn't in the movie a lot, but really nails every scene she's in. And Dave Batista, for once, gets to flex his acting muscles in a dramatic role with Sapper Morton, an older Nexus model replicant who Kay tracks down at the beginning of the film. Apparently, Sapper Morton was in the original script for the first Blade Runner. His scene opened the film, and I guess Ridley always imagined a scene involving soup, so they brought that back for the sequel. And of course, Harrison Ford returned to play an older, grizzled Deckard. There are some other characters that bear mentioning, but I'm gonna save them for later. The plot of Blade Runner 2049 is essentially following this new Blade Runner officer, KD6-3.7, or K for short. He is sent on a mission to find a child that was born from a replicant and kill it, and this leads him to many unexpected discoveries that might break the world. So with that, Let's talk about some issues with Blade Runner and the cyberpunk genre. Now, while I am in no way qualified to talk about this, a lot has been written and said by qualified people about the fetishization of Asian aesthetics in cyberpunk, something that was popularized by the original Blade Runner film, which utilized Chinese and Japanese lettering in a lot of the designs, not to mention this iconic shot showing this giant ad with a woman that I think is supposed to be dressed as a geisha. But for all the Asian aesthetics in cyberpunk, there are not a lot of Asian characters, at least not in Western cyberpunk media. Like, unless you're really paying attention and looking at the background actors, I think the original Blade Runner had this guy on screen for about five seconds, and this dude who was in one scene and handles an eyeball with chopsticks and then probably dies. In the new Blade Runner, we do have Dave Bautista, who's mixed race, Greek and Filipino, but that's it. And he's only in the film for maybe five minutes. A little more than five if you include the prequel short Nowhere to Run, which was one of three short films released online before the film. According to one Vice article, the neon kanji billboards, Neander Wallace's Yukata, and Joy's Cheung Sem, the busy Chinatown, the interactive wall of anime apps, Kay's rice-filled bento box, the dual Japanese-English text on everything, all signs that point to a vibrant, multicultural city, but somehow devoid of non-white characters. If Asians shaped this cyberpunk future, where are they? Author William Gibson, who wrote the 1984 novel Neuromancer, another lodestone of the cyberpunk genre, once said, Modern Japan simply was cyberpunk. The Japanese themselves knew it and delighted in it. I remember my first glimpse of Shibuya, when one of the young Tokyo journalists who had taken me there, his face drenched with the light of a thousand media suns, all that towering animated crawl of commercial information, said, You see? You see? It is Blade Runner Town. And it was. It so evidently was. Now, it's true that cyberpunk has been embraced in Japan, where works like Akira, Ghost in the Shell, and Cowboy Bebop build off the genre and aesthetics of works like Blade Runner. And while some of the symbiosis between East and West has led to fun movies like The Matrix, or even to a fun little crossover, for lack of a better word, Shinichiro Watanabe, the creator of the legendary Cowboy Bebop, cited Blade Runner as one of his inspirations for the anime, and he was brought in to do one of the other prequel shorts for Blade Runner 2049, Blackout. There's a great video about this by Captain Christian, I'll link it in the description. But this symbiosis has, unfortunately, also led us to works like Joss Whedon's Firefly, where everybody likes to swear in Chinese and none of the main cast members are of Asian descent. And in Blade Runner 2049, we see the influence of Asian culture everywhere, but aside from Sapper Morton, there are no Asian characters, which makes the use of the culture more for aesthetic than anything else. And then there's the bigotry allegory of the replicants, and by extension, all the built characters in the film. Fuck off, skin job. Replicants are called skin jobs like it's a slur, and Joy, an AI, is told by a replicant she's even less because she's not a real girl. I've been inside you. Not so much there as you think. You don't like real girls. 
Now, for this bigotry allegory, I will once again bring up Dave Batista and also Anna de Armas, who is Cuban. So, while the group being mistreated is not entirely white, it is entirely being experienced by light-skinned people. In a Vulture article called Why Don't Dystopias Know How to Talk About Race by Angelica Jade Bastian, the author points out, Dystopias feel poignant because they carry the weight of real-world history and dissect today's problems through a futuristic lens. But they can't ever be fully separated from the history that powers their narratives. In film and TV, this sets up an incongruity. The genre hyper-consumes the narrative of people of color, which read as allegories for slavery and colonialism, yet remains starkly white in the casting of major roles, and often refuses to acknowledge race altogether. Most dystopias, Gattaca, Dark City, Code 46, THX 1138, Aeon Flux, Robocop, Judge Dredd, and countless other examples, render oppression solely or most prominently along class lines. Furthermore, works like Mad Max Fury Road, Strange Days, V for Vendetta, Westworld, and The Handmaid's Tale more directly take on misogyny to varying degrees. Somehow, racism is non-existent, but the allegories are rarely subtle. Whether it be District 9 reimagining apartheid through insect-like aliens, the grating exoticism of Firefly, which takes the idea of the Civil War into distant space, or the offensive contradictions in the recent whitewashed Ghosts in the Shell adaptation. Often, there's also the suggestion that everything is so devastating, racial hierarchies become less important. Take the showrunner of The Handmaid's Tale, suggesting that fertility would supersede other issues. This sort of argument would be troubling in any genre, but in dystopias, a genre that is meant to illuminate and critique current societal problems by reconfiguring them in an exaggerated but still somewhat plausible context, it becomes especially so. If dystopias are meant to imagine our future and reconfigure our present, what does it say that filmmakers are unable to reckon with the racial implications of their stories? In Blade Runner 2049, replicants are considered lesser in a way that is coded at times like racism. Their bodies are sexualized, exoticized, and older replicant models are even displayed like trophies at the Wallace Corporation, which calls to mind all manner of horrendous bits of history. Ridley Scott said the world of Blade Runner indirectly evolved into a condition of apartheid, and director Denis Villeneuve's rulebook, written to update the world's official canon, says, Replicants are still produced as slave laborers with limited rights that are allowed to live on Earth among the human population. They are perceived as abominations and third-class citizens. And yet our main replicant experiencing this allegorical bigotry is white. His replicant and AI acquaintances throughout the film are all either white or light-skinned. There are almost no black characters in the film, I've counted three. This LAPD officer who is callous towards replicants, this cellar guy, Doc Badger, who is a touch sketchy but helpful, the art book describes him as a working man with many tricks up his sleeve, and the character with the most screen time, maybe five minutes or so, is named Mr. Cotton and is a child slaver. Like most bigotry allegories, the one in Blade Runner and Blade Runner 2049 is messy. I don't think anybody set out to actively make something cruel or bigoted, but I also think maybe the creative team didn't really think it all the way through. I know my friend Aranok has a whole queer reading of Blade Runner 2049, which is still messy, but definitely less messy. I'll leave a link to that video in the description. For me, personally, bigotry allegories remind me a lot of the first season of Man in the High Castle. Cheyenne Lynn did a great video on the whole series, I'll link to that as well, but the short version is, the show was a chance for white gentiles to play act the fun scenario of, what if we were oppressed by Nazis? I know there are one or two Jewish characters in that show, but I'm sorry, it's not enough for me, and I'm not interested in seeing white gentiles cosplay suburban oppression at the hands of the Nazis. I doubt Denis Villeneuve and Ryan Gosling thought they were cosplaying oppression, and as bigotry allegories go, Blade Runner 2049 is miles better than something like Carnival Row, but allegorical bigotry that ignores the real bigotry people face in the real world will always be, at its best, a bit messy. So let's talk about the original Blade Runner and its sequel. Okay, so while I'm here, I'm just going to say I don't like the original Blade Runner. <gasps> I know, call the movie police. I have to turn in my nerd credentials or something. 
I told you about when I watched it the first time and had the best scene interrupted, but I rewatched it as an adult and honestly, I feel like, aside from the beautiful aesthetics, there just isn't a lot there for me. Now, for some added context, I haven't seen the theatrical cut beyond some potato quality clips of that ending with the horrendous voiceover, so I don't know if the original version also left audiences questioning whether Harrison Ford's Deckard was a replicant, but I can tell you the final cut definitely leaves some big hints about it, although still without stating it openly. This is probably because the creators don't actually agree on this point. Ridley Scott thinks he's a replicant, hence the very leading visual cues in the original film with the origami and that one scene where his eyes are unnaturally lit up like the other replicants. Meanwhile, Harrison Ford and Hampton Fancher think he's a human. But I find that, beyond the interesting aesthetic and world building, there wasn't much that grabbed me in the original Blade Runner. On rewatching it, I mostly vacillated between mild interest and occasional repulsion at some of the gorier sequences. Also, this movie really loves to luxuriate in violence against women. Like, when male replicants get killed on screen, it's either brief and brutal or tragic and restrained. Meanwhile, the sequences of women replicants being murdered is just... It's a lot. I do find the final sequences pretty compelling. Roy Batty does indeed have an incredible final speech. I see why it's so well remembered. I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. But the ideas about what makes a person as a theme is, in my opinion, far better explored in the sequel 2049, because both are interested in the personhood of the replicants. But I suspect that the journey we as an audience are meant to take is one where we're often scared of and horrified by the replicants in the original. Obviously, Rachel adds some complexity, but mostly it's pretty straightforward until the movie starts hinting that Rick Deckard is also a replicant. The final moment with the origami unicorn is, I think, meant to make audiences go, wow, is Deckard a replicant? But he's so frail and human, not like those other replicants. And that just feels a little basic compared to the themes of the sequel, where we just start with the assumption that replicants are people because our main character seems like one, and we move on from there to more interesting territory. In the beginning of 2049, we meet Kay out on a job. He's come to this plastic farm where they, I guess, farm these nematode worms as a food source. And there he meets Sapper Morton, a replicant he's supposed to retire. Mr. Morton. If taking you in is an option, I would much prefer that to the alternative. Kay and we, the audience, quickly realize Sapper won't come quietly. After a tense scene, the pair kick the shit out of each other. And before his death, Sapper gets the speech that really feels like this movie's attempt at Roy Batty's Tears in the Rain speech from the original. I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. Because you've never seen a miracle. He says the new replicant models are happy scraping up the shit of humans. And then he rushes at Kay like he might attack him, and Kay kills him. He goes outside and has his little drone take photos of the area, including this dead tree with a box buried beneath it, while he checks in with his boss, Lieutenant Joshi. And in a moment that is very telling about Kay's life and general existence, when Joshi sees his injuries, she says, You're hurt. I'm not paying for that which tells you how little his life and well-being are valued in this society. Then he returns to the LAPD for what the film calls his post-traumatic baseline test, a bizarre interrogation where he responds to some sort of strange script while his responses are measured and recorded. What's it like to hold your child in your arms? Interlinked. Interlinked. Do you feel that there's a part of you that's missing? Interlinked. Interlinked. Within cells, interlinked. As we will later learn, if he is off his baseline, i.e. responding emotionally to all the murder he's made to do, he will probably be put down. From there, he goes home to an apartment that appears sterile and lifeless, except for Joy. Joy the AI is a creation that we see advertised several times throughout the film. It would also appear from a few B-roll shots in the behind the scenes that they filmed some scenes with another version of Joy as well. But our Joy is really interesting. She's essentially performing emotional labor for Kay, being the sympathetic housewife to her hard-working husband. But what I find really interesting is all the moments when Kay makes it clear he wants her to just be herself. I'm so happy when I'm with you. You don't have to say that. I want to be real for you. You are real for me. 
He wants her to respond as herself, to not just respond to him in the way she was programmed. He wants her to have agency. Would you read to me? It'll make you feel better. You hate that book. The pair flirt for a little bit until Kay tells her, Do you want to dance or do you want to open your present? What he got her was an emanator, a little doodad that allows Joy to move beyond their apartment to anywhere where he brings the emanator. Where do you want to go first? She wants to go outside, and so on the rooftop in the rain, the two share an intimate moment as she experiences rain for the first time. The moment is interrupted by a call from work, the downside of having a girlfriend who is also a phone. He goes in to find out that they dug up the box from Sapper's farm that was buried beneath that dead tree. Inside the box are human remains. They can tell from the bones that the remains are of a woman who gave birth. Kay is the one who notices the serial number carved into the bone, which means this woman was a replicant, and replicants can't have children. Lieutenant Joshi says this can't happen, and the fact that it did can't be found out. Kay is ordered to track down the child of this replicant woman and kill it. And Kay observes, I've never retired something I was born before. What's the difference? To be born is to have a soul, I guess. Lieutenant Joshi tells him he's been getting on fine without one. What's that, madam? A soul. Denis Villeneuve is a curious phenomenon as a filmmaker. His career kind of comes in three phases. His early films, largely produced in Quebec, are often based around a single strange premise. In the short film Next Floor, an opulent feast continues until the floor literally breaks beneath the weight of their consumption, and then the feast continues on the next floor. In 120 Seconds to Get Elected, a politician frantically tries to appeal to a crowd for 120 seconds. Even his early features seem based around similarly simple but off-kilter premises. August 32nd on Earth, his first feature, is about a woman who wants to conceive a child with her best friend, and he agrees as long as they do it in a desert. And Maelstrom is a story about a woman's emotional journey after a car accident, which is shared with us by a dying fish. And it should be noted, he wrote the scripts for all of these films. But after Maelstrom, which was released in the year 2000, he didn't make another feature film for nine years. He spoke of his early work as being somewhat flawed and amateurish. I was obsessed with making a feature film before I was 30 years old. To make a first feature film as young as possible, Villeneuve explained. I did it too quickly. I felt like I was doing things upside down. I was more obsessed by the idea of defining my identity as a filmmaker instead of just enjoying the act of making a movie for other people. I had a more narcissistic approach. I thought to myself, I need to go back to school, I need to learn how to write movies, how to direct actors, and my kids at the time were very young, so I was feeling the need to spend more time at home. Now those short films I mentioned, 120 Seconds to Get Elected and Next Floor, were made in the nine-year gap as he eased himself into a different style of filmmaking, which he really cemented with the 2009 Polytechnic. This is where we get to the middle phase of his films, which I like to call the dark character studies. They're all excellently made and miserable to watch. Polytechnic is about a real-life school shooting that happened in Montreal in 1989. There's Incendies, based on a play of same name that follows these two siblings on this journey to unearth their mother's deeply traumatizing history. Then he made the move to Hollywood filmmaking with Prisoners, about two children who are abducted and the lengths their fathers go to try and find them. Next, there's Enemy, which is about Jake Gyllenhaal and Jake Gyllenhaal, and if you have arachnophobia, you should not watch this movie! After that, there was Sicario, starring Emily Blunt and Benicio Del Toro. It's a mildly irresponsible film about an extrajudicial drug war with Mexico. The first, in the words of Atlantic critic David Sims, capitalized on easy stereotypes about life on the border, but at least made sure to portray America's complicity and uselessness which is more than can be said for the sequel that was also written by Taylor Sheridan, which is, by all accounts, a worse and more irresponsible movie. But after Sicario, we get Arrival, and the beginning of his big thinky sci-fi phase, which he is still in with Blade Runner 2049 and now the Dune movies. 
From watching all his films and some of his short films, it's clear he has some thematic preoccupations, but he also has some visual ideas that recur. For example, this man loves him a desert. No, seriously, there are a lot of deserts in his movies. In one interview, he said on the subject, I was raised by the St. Lawrence River, and I was someone who spent a very meditative childhood looking at the horizon. There are similarities in wintertime with the horizon. It's like something that has an impact on the soul. I think that my deep attraction to the desert is that the emptiness, the infinity of the desert, is like a kind of mirror. It's like an inner journey, being in contact with infinity. It's bringing you back to your own humility, your own place in the world, your own singularity. Its silence is my best friend, my companion. Silence is like a comfort for me. It's a mirror of your own inner soul. He also seems to have a bit of a thing about car accidents. There are a fair amount of those in his films as well. But what's interesting is also the ways his style has developed over the course of his films. His first feature, August 32nd on Earth, plays with some stylistic choices none of his other films would use. There are these abrupt quick cuts and whip pans often used to transition us from one scene to the next. In several of his early films, there are also some interesting fourth wall breaks. Like this one in August 32nd is quite funny, and this one in Incendies is haunting. All of his movies are interesting to watch, but I'm grateful he took what he learned from the dark character studies and moved away from the nihilism and brutality of many of those films. Although Villeneuve said a defining quality of Blade Runner 2049 was brutality and chaos, there's enough light and warmth in the story to mitigate that. Like, if you want to watch his full filmography, look up content warnings for Incendies and Sicario. There is some really horrific stuff in there. But he seems to have moved into a new stage of filmmaking, where all that character work is now serving stories that have a bit more going on than just brutality. And I'm a fan of that. Villeneuve has stated that he loves writing about change. I'm deeply obsessed by the idea that we can change, that we can evolve as human beings. The idea that we are struggling with the burden of genetics, education, family, the past, politics, religion, all the influences as a human being. Really, I think that these movies have that in common. This quest to free the soul from that heritage and this relationship with the past. That's what brings me hope for humanity as well. I think we can evolve. But if we are not aware of it, we are condemned. Hell is repetition. In this next part of the film, Kay tries to track down the child of this dead replicant woman. He goes to the Wallace Corporation to look up the woman's serial number. He hears a recording of her being questioned by an officer Deckard and starts looking into him too. Along the way, we meet Love, who is the right-hand woman of Neander Wallace. I'm here for Mr. Wallace. I'm Love. He named you. Must be special. We later get a horrifying sequence that sort of implies what Love's daily life is, when Wallace examines a newly born replicant he designed. He says they're designing angels, and he wants them to be able to procreate or whatever, so the world will be filled with his angels. This replicant doesn't meet his standards, so he stabs her, and as he leaves, he says, The best angel of all, aren't you, love? In one scene, Kay eats at a market, and that's how we meet Mariette. She's a sex worker, or a pleasure model, to use the film's parlance. We see her and several other sex workers being told by this woman to investigate Kay. But the other women are quickly put off when they realize Kay is a Blade Runner. Men, that's a bit of bar. It's okay. It's fine. But Mariette sticks around and flirts a bit more until she hears the Wallace Corporation jingle coming from Kay's emanator. Oh. You don't like real girls. After this, he returns to Sapper's farm and finds an old baby's sock and a photo. As he leaves, he burns down the farm since there can be no trace of this replicant woman or her child. And then he stops and examines the dead tree and notices that it has the numbers 6, 10, 21 carved into a root. And this seems to scare the shit out of him. Meanwhile, Love comes to the LAPD to steal the remains of this replicant woman. When this guy tries to stop her, Love kills him. Captain Joshi visits Kay, upset that word has already gotten out about the dead replicant woman. Am I the only one that can see the fucking sunrise here? 
This breaks the world, Kay. She demands to know how Kay's investigation is going, and once Kay lays out all his current leads, Lieutenant Joshi settles in for a chat. She muses aloud about how she forgets sometimes that Kay is a replicant. We didn't have any of you where I was a kid. Then she asks if he has any memories of his childhood. He points out that all his memories are implanted, but Joshi asks that he tell her about one anyway. So he tells her a story about when he was small and he had a toy, a carved wooden horse. One day, some other kids tried to take the toy from him, so he hid it and pretended he had destroyed it. The other children beat him for it, but he was satisfied in the knowledge that he had protected what was his. Later, Joy points out to him that the toy in that story has those same numbers carved into it, 6, 10, 21. She believes that Kay is the child they're searching for, I always knew you were special. Meanwhile, Kay's search takes him through data archives of orphaned kids. When he finds two genetic records that match perfectly, for a boy and a girl, this leads him to an orphanage on the outskirts of LA. According to the records, the girl died, so he wants to look at the orphanage's own records for confirmation. The place is run by Mr. Cotton, who is essentially using these children for slave labor, and his records are a dead end. But the orphanage looks a little familiar to Kay, so he goes looking around and finds the wooden horse from his memory, hidden precisely where he remembered leaving it. This scares the shit out of him and leads him to Dr. Anna Staline, the woman who makes memories for Wallace Corporation replicants like Kay. She's very sweet in this scene, as she explains that she's too ill to go outside, so making these memories is a way to exercise her imagination. And she hopes that it gives replicants something warm and nice to think back on during their hard lives. I can't help your future, but I can give you good memories to think back on and smile. Kay asks if there's a way to tell if a memory was real or implanted. They all think it's about more detail, but that's not how memory works. You recall with our feelings, anything real should be a mess. So she has him look through this device and think of the memory. Afterwards, she wipes away tears and tells him, Someone left this, yes. Once again, Kay freaks the fuck out and leaves. Kay walks outside and is immediately grabbed by the LAPD. We see him doing a baseline test, which he fails. Joshi chews him out, but he tells her he found and killed the child. For that, Joshi says he's got 48 hours to get back on his baseline. After that, his fate is out of her hands. Then he goes home to Joy, who this whole time has been on her own journey. We see how she's still frustrated by her physical limitations. In one heartbreaking scene when Kay crashes his little hover car thing, which is called a spinner, I think, Joy's emanator glitches out and she seems desperate to help Kay, but is unable to even touch him. Kay. After Kay finds the wooden toy at the orphanage, Joy seems as overwhelmed as Kay is by the seeming confirmation that Kay is a real boy, to use her words. She says he needs a real name, and she calls him Joe. But clearly she feels that she herself is lacking now, still being an AI, still being without a body. So when Kay comes home from all these revelations, he finds Joy and Mariette. Joy invited Mariette because she says she could tell that Kay liked her, and she wants to basically have sex with Kay by proxy, which is a thing that AIs and replicants can do, apparently. She tells him that she wants to be real for him. You are real for me. But it's what she wants, and so Kay agrees. And by the way, I just need you to know, when this scene was filmed, it basically filmed twice, one with each actress, and the two performances were digitally melded together in post. But Ryan Gosling had to stay perfectly on his mark for the shots to match, so just look at how they managed that. I call it the Ryan box. So with that attempt at a segue, let's talk about some cool behind the scenes stuff. So the behind the scenes of Blade Runner 2049 involved assembling a team of dreamers, according to Villeneuve. Roger Deakins, production designers, and storyboard artists just spent several weeks in a hotel room in Montreal coming up with ideas and designs for the film. The central design ethos was the aforementioned brutalism and chaos. They took a lot of design inspiration from comic book artists like Enki Bilal and Jean Girard, who often used the pseudonym Mobius. 
Villeneuve said that since the original Blade Runner was set in 2019 and was already a dystopian alternative future, 2049 would have to imagine how this alternative future would evolve over the following 30 years. There were no iPhones, there was no internet, and the USSR still ruled half the world. So with that in mind, a lot of the technology is very mechanical in nature. There aren't a lot of touchscreens and so on, but there's plenty of dials and knobs everywhere you look. They also went back to the original mind behind the look of the first Blade Runner, Sid Mead. He was asked to help design the 2049 Las Vegas we see in the film. We can see many of his ideas and concepts in the final film. Concept artist Sam Hudecki described the first film's style as Asian-influenced punk, but for 2049, they went for more of a brutalist Russian aesthetic. And they coined the term urban snow trash to describe it. In terms of some random factoids, Kay's baseline test was actually largely written by Ryan Gosling, as a little exercise he did to, like, get in Kay's head. Some of the words are from Vladimir Nabokov's Pale Fire, but put a pin in that for later. Also, as an aside, if you want to laugh, I do recommend looking up press that Ryan Gosling and Harrison Ford did for the movie. It's pretty funny. Notice there's nothing left for me. She's wrong. <laughs> yeah, there was never a moment where Harrison was like, was I'm gonna go wail on my pecs, you know? It's you so never asked me to go wail on my pecs. Do you guys I'm, need help with the, the cameras? Can I... <laughs> 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 also, I already mentioned him once, but it has to be said that Roger Deakins is a big part of why this movie looks gorgeous. He helped engineer insanely complicated lighting rigs for the Wallace Corporation, as well as this light show sequence in a Vegas casino. And he even had scenes like this one filmed beneath a water tank to get the particular light effect rippling on the walls. This movie is stunning. Basically, all hail Roger Deakins. This was his first Oscar win, and it was well-deserved. Then there's the film's commitment to practical effects. Villeneuve said he hated green screen. Real environments are inspiring and trigger ideas. My movies are not designed by computers. They are dreamed by actors first, he said. As a rule, movies made using more practical effects than digital are just going to look better and age better. Wasting billions of dollars to make actors stand in an empty green screen space is never going to look as good as grounding scenes with some practical elements. Movies like Avatar are basically trumped up animated films at this point, while Marvel films mostly look like trash because they underpay and overwork their CG teams and expect them to basically construct entire portions of the film in post. Meanwhile, movies like Blade Runner 2049 and Pacific Rim hold up great because there are a lot of practical elements to ground everything. In 2049, one of the major practical elements they used were models. They're technically miniatures, but to follow the parlance of the Lord of the Rings behind the scenes crew, I think they should be called bigotures, because these things are huge. These models were all built, as it happens, at Weta Workshop by the same team that built the bigotures for the Lord of the Rings. Then there are the technically cheap tricks, like in this scene in the LAPD office of Lieutenant Joshi. For the reverse shot where you can see outside the window, they used painted and lit up cardboard cutouts with rain and mist machines to complete the effect. Or in this scene with Dr. Anna Staline designing a memory of a birthday, the crew built a gobo cake stand rig. Gobo means graphical optical blackout, or goes before optics. It's a device that produces sharp-edged shadows. In this case, the stand simulates the light and shadows cast by lit candles on a rotating and tilting birthday cake, which was added later by the VFX team. Some of the practical effects they used and created were a little bit more technical and expensive, like the Sepulveda seawall, where a portion of the climax takes place. The scene was too ambitious. No water tank in the world could pull it off, so we decided to build a million-gallon tank that could, just to get it right, says executive producer Bill Carrero. Or they're just borderline insane, like the scene where we see a replicant born and they literally vacuum-sealed that actress in that plastic. 
There was a stunt supervisor making sure the actress could breathe through a tube between takes. Then there are the numerous detailed props like the spinners, where they built several rigs to have the things move and lift on camera, to smaller props like Dr. Anna Staline's memory machine. This little guy was functionally based off of camera lenses and was a fully practical prop that the actress could move and twist on camera. There's a lot about the design and behind the scenes that I love. So much work went into making this film beautiful. So many talented artists put their heart and soul into this picture. To lightly quote the director, a team really did dream this movie into existence. So, the morning after their special night, Kay and Joy have a conversation. Kay is going to have to run from the LAPD, and Joy wants to come with him. She says if they accessed her archives, they could find information on Kay, so she wants those archives deleted and to be fully uploaded to the Emanator. If anything happens to this, that's it. You're gone. Yes, like a real girl. After some cajoling, Kay agrees because it's what she wants. So after a bit of sleuthing, having this guy like carbon date the wood of the toy horse or something, they go to a bombed out Las Vegas. According to the art book, a dirty bomb was dropped on Las Vegas and that's why it's like this. Kay ends up at this messed up old casino where he finds Deckard, alone except for a dog and quoting Treasure Island while holding him at gunpoint. Many is the night I dream of cheese. Now Kay really is here to just ask some questions. Questions like, hey, are you my dad? But Deckard's paranoia leads to a fight between them. It's a stunning sequence with these entertainment projections flickering on and off throughout it. I actually got to listen to editor Joe Walker talk about the development of this sequence. Apparently in early versions, it was much louder with more music and more projections. But in the end, they realized the silence and the soft flickers of these projectors made for a more interesting scene. But what I find really upsetting in this scene is the way Kay remains on the defensive the entire time. He runs away, deflects hits, and by the end is just letting himself be punched over and over again rather than hurt this guy. Because, you know. Eventually, Deckard gets the message and they talk. Well, honestly, they bicker, and Deckard avoids answering Kay's questions, but finally he tells Kay the name of the woman who might have been his mother. Rachel. Kay asks what happened to the kid, whether the kid was put in an orphanage, and Deckard says he was long gone by then. When Kay asks why, Deckard tells him that was the plan, that they were being hunted, and that everybody had a part and his was to leave. He didn't want his kid to be taken apart and dissected. Sometimes to love someone, you gotta be a stranger. Also notably, Deckard asks for his name. Officer KD6-3. That's not a name. That's a serial number. And K tells him his name is Joe, the name Joy gave him. And Deckard calls him that for the rest of the movie. There's also this scene where we see Love barge into Lieutenant Joshi's office trying to track down K. Joshi gives her nothing except the false information that Kay killed the child. You're so sure. Because he told you. Because we never lie. So Love kills Joshi and then uses her system to find more information leading to the moment when, back at the casino, Deckard asks if Kay brought anybody with him. He didn't and he thought he wasn't being followed, but he was wrong. The pair try and make some sort of escape, and just 10 out of 10 for this bit where Deckard runs through this door and shuts it behind him, so Kay just Kool-Aid mans through a wall? Oh yeah! But they're both too late. A missile is shot at the casino, and a bunch of guys show up and nab Deckard. Kay tries to fight back, but Love is there to kick the shit out of him. Bad dog. Joy appears from the Emanator and begs Love to stop. Instead, Love crushes the emanator beneath her boot. Joy's last words are an attempt to say, I love you, before she's gone. From there, everybody takes Deckard and leaves Kay for dead. But earlier, when Mariette was at their apartment, she planted a tracker on him, so her people show up and take him. When he's finally recovered enough to be fully conscious, he's upset and confused. 
Mariette is sitting with him, and I just really like this silent moment between the two of them. But then she asks him to listen as this woman, Fraza, steps forward. She tells him that she was there for the birth of Deckard and Rachel's child, and that this girl will be the spark that starts a new replicant revolution. But if Wallace has Deckard, then he's a liability, and Kay must kill Deckard to protect that girl. This is when we and Kay realize he was never the child. Deckard was never his father. He's just a normal replicant like the rest of them. He even remembers Dr. Anna Staline's statement on the memory, now with new context. Someone lived this, yes. But he seemingly agrees with their plan to kill Deckard. And on his way to his spinner, he sees a big advertisement for the Joy AI. This one is almost haunting and soulless, with her bright pink skin, blue hair, and empty black eyes. She says familiar phrases like, What a day. And she tells him he looks like a good Joe. There's a lot of ways that you can read Kay's reaction to this. In my opinion, I think Kay takes this as confirmation that none of his relationship with Joy was real that she was just telling him what he wanted to hear. It was all just her programming. None of it was real. Now, we need to talk about themes. A big one that has been discussed as a detractor of the film by many critics is the objectification of women's bodies. And to be clear, I like and respect many of these critics. I strongly disagree with them, but I understand how many came to this conclusion. First, we have to talk about the women in the film. Quite a few of them die. Joshi, Joy, and Love eventually. But what I find fascinating is how all the women in the film push the story forward. Kay is a very passive character. All his motivation comes from the women around him. The women in his life are moving the story. It's Joshi who demands that he track down the child. It's Mariette who plants the tracker on him and finds him later. It's Joy who chooses to have her program uploaded to the Emanator. Love who kidnaps Deckard and kills Joy. And Fraza and Mariette send Kay on his final path to track down Deckard. We spend half the movie thinking Kay is this magical, faded child, but he isn't. She is. Kay's not some special, important, chosen one. He's just some guy we happen to be following who tangentially participates in larger events and pieces together some important clues. But there is an element of objectification in the film as well, which I would argue is mostly used very purposefully. I think these statues and these shots of the naked sex workers are maybe a little less pointed, although presumably all of these sex workers are working with the Replicant Rebellion, so that's neat. But most of the objectification we see in the film is specifically created and perpetrated by the Wallace Corporation, who are the bad guys. The replicants are working against the powers that be for freedom and personhood, and that includes the Wallace Corporation. So the fact that we see women's bodies handled so callously by them and objectified by the camera in those scenes seems to me to be a commentary on capitalism dehumanizing marginalized bodies. We actually see a few men's bodies in a similar fashion. Sapper Morton's body is just casually laid out at the LAPD, and a model of his body and several other male replicants are on display in this scene in the Wallace Corporation. All of this brings us to, I think, the most divisive and, in my opinion, misunderstood element of the film, joy. In the final scene with our Joy, she's killed professing her love to Kay, and then the next we see of her is this advertisement for the AI, naked and highly objectified, again being treated as a commodity and less than a person by a corporation. But then she echoes several phrases that our Joy used to say to Kay. What a day. Hmm? Was a day. Huh? She calls him a good Joe, echoing the name Joy gave him. Joe. I think it's pretty clear that Kay believes their relationship was all fake and pre-programmed from this scene. Not that his love for her was fake, but her responses were all pre-programmed. 
that she was telling him what he wanted to hear, as the advertisement says. But I don't think that's meant to be our takeaway. The fact that Joy had programmed responses is not that different from learned phrases we pick up in our daily lives. She might have a preference for the name Joe based on her programming, but that doesn't mean her feelings weren't real, or that she had no agency. It is her decision to be uploaded to the Emanator. Kay balks initially, but it's what she wants. So eventually he gives in. Joe, please. I want this. But I can't do it myself. I think Kay's insistence on her personhood and agency allowed her to evolve. I'm so happy when I'm with you. You don't have to say that. Maybe there are other Joys in this world who have evolved into similar or very different people. I don't think this makes her relationship with Kay any less. I think believing, in this moment like Kay does, that Joy was just a program with no agency is antithetical to the film's entire message. Because as previously stated, Blade Runner 2049 starts by telling us the replicants, the AI, they're all people with real emotions that matter. Even if they have programmed responses or implanted memories, they're still people. If we, the audience, believe Joy is less than a person, then we would have to believe the same of Kay. And the fact is, the main romance in the film is largely non-sexual. The only sex scene in the movie is not filmed in an objectifying way. If anything, it's kind of off-putting, honestly, which I think is pretty interesting. And the relationship between Kay and Joy is one based in mutual respect in the other's agency and autonomy, with both of them affirming the other. The alphabet of you, all from four symbols. I'm only two. Half as much, but twice as elegant, sweetheart. You're special. A real boy needs a real name. I just think that's nice. And even if it's not perfect, I think it's a far cry from the misogynistic mess that many people accused it of being. Next, we need to talk about Pale Fire. The book by Vladimir Nabokov is featured several times throughout the film, both in the book itself and in the lines of Kay's baseline test. And blood black nothingness began to spin. A system of cells interlinked within cells interlinked within cells interlinked within one stem and dreadfully distinct against the dark, a tall white fountain played. These are the lines in the third canto of the lengthy poem Pale Fire. Now, in order to explain Pale Fire, I wanted to bring in Vladimir Nabokov expert Lola Sebastian to talk about what this movie is doing with its repeated references to Pale Fire. Take it away, Lola! Pale Fire by Vladimir Nabokov is a postmodernist masterpiece with two fictional narrators, John Shade and Charles Kinboat. It's written as a poem written by Shade called Pale Fire, and a foreword, commentary, and an index written by Kinboat. Through a series of suspicious circumstances, Professor Charles Kinboat becomes the editor of John Shade's poem after death. It is abundantly clear that he is unwell, if not fully delusional or possessed. He provides analysis of the poem to the reader, but misinterprets the poem miserably. The poem is clearly autobiographical and tells the story of Shade's life, but Kinboat interprets the poem to be about how he is secretly King Charles the Beloved, the deposed king of Kinboat's home country, Zembla. Thus, the reader is challenged to decipher what's even happening. As Kinboat is an unreliable narrator, Nabokov's favorite, the dissonance between what's said and what actually happens is crucial. The very act Joy suggests, that Kay read from Pale Fire, is an odd thing to ask as the book can be read in a variety of ways. Some suggest reading the novel front to back, while others suggest reading the annotations as they appear in the poem, referring to the index when needed. To read from Pale Fire is not a straightforward task. Despite suggesting he read to her, it's acknowledged that Joy does not like Pale Fire. You hate that book. I don't want to read either. She has opinions that differ from Kay's. Could this be a sign that she's coming into her own autonomy? Parallels can also be drawn between Joy and Hazel Shade, John's daughter who tragically dies and is the subject of the poem. Nabokov's biographer Brian Boyd, probably the most prolific Nabokov scholar, suggested in his book on Pale Fire that what actually happens is this. The ghost of Hazel Shade possesses Charles Kinboat as he's annotating in order to tell her own story through him. The book, Pale Fire, is therefore hers. Modernist scholar Helen Sword wrote about this as well in her book, Ghostwriting Modernism. There are also parallels with Kay's relationship to the book itself. 
As previously stated, Pale Fire is a book that can be read in several different orders, and Kay clearly has a highly disordered relationship to the text through the words he is made to say in his baseline test. Do they keep you in a cell? Cells. Cells. When you're not performing your duties, do they keep you in a little box? Cells. Cells. Interlinked. Interlinked. But within the text itself, comparisons can be drawn between K and Kinboat other than their K names. Both have false memories they firmly believe in, and become convinced of this deeper meaning and secret other life they have, which ends up being untrue. Kinboat is convinced that the Pale Fire poem is about him, and K becomes convinced that this movie is about him, thinking he is the fated child of Deckard and Rachel when he isn't. In reality, he is a secondary character in a larger story that he is somewhat unaware of. Both characters are also allegedly being hunted by an assassin as the story progresses. Kinboat believes that someone named Gratis is trying to kill him. Kinboat blames Gratis for Shade's mysterious death on the night he finishes his poem. And Kay is of course being pursued by the LAPD and the Wallace Corporation at various points. Of course, it must be said that Kinboat's delusions are not reality. He is actually Professor V. Botkin, a Russian-born language professor who believes himself to be Charles Kinboat. In my humble opinion, he's a satire of modernist scholars, particularly scholars of Pound and Eliot, always creating hidden meanings that aren't there. Nabokov infamously fought with his colleagues on a few occasions over the inherent anti-Semitism of lifting up certain modernist figures, especially Ezra Pound. Botkin, a lonely and depraved Shade fanboy, convinces himself that if he tells Shade all about his homeland, Shade will be so inspired that he'll have no other choice but to write the greatest poem of all time about Zembla. On the night the poem is finished and Shade and Kinboat are primed to celebrate, a man arrives on Botkin's doorstep and kills Shade. The man is not Gratis, but Jack Gray, an escaped inmate from an insane asylum. He was attempting to murder the judge who sentenced him, the person Kinboat is renting his house from. Thematically, the novel is very much about the damage, isolation, and social ostracization can do to a person. Although Botkin is abhorrent, Shade befriends him out of pity when he notices his deteriorating mental state. Botkin has essentially nothing in his life outside of his obsession with Shade, and when Shade dies, he detaches from reality completely. At the heart of it all is Botkin's desire to be Shade and, perhaps, Hazel Shade's desire to be herself. Mistaken her hidden identities are a frequent motif. And yes, it is implied that Botkin dies at the end, his mission completed. I've read Pale Fire at least six times. <laughs> I did a massive project on it for my undergrad, and I still feel like I barely have a grip on it. It's that intense, and each time I read it, I learn so much more. I also think it's interesting how Pale Fire and Blade Runner 2049 are both solid examples of metafiction. Thank you so much for having me on. Back to the regular video. <laughs> Thanks, Lola. I just think it's really interesting that Pale Fire gives us Within cells interlinked, within cells interlinked, within cells interlinked. This story and its themes are so interconnected, both with the original Blade Runner, of course. If we get them past, we create a cushion pillow for their emotions, and consequently we can control them better. You're talking about memories. Wallace needs my talent to maintain a stable product. And if you have authentic memories, you'll have real human responses. But also with sci-fi as a whole. Sci-fi is, I think, the genre that is most interested in exploring what makes us human. What makes somebody a person. Anything real should be a mess. All ideas that are explored and interlinked in this film. So, at the end of the film, Kay tracks down Deckard. But first, there's this scene of Wallace being creepy to Deckard. He made a copy of Rachel, but Deckard knows that's not the woman he loved. All he says is, her eyes are the wrong color, and Love shoots her. From there, we see Deckard is being taken somewhere by Love in her spinner, flanked by some security guys. When Deckard asks where they're going, Love just says, Home. God knows what that means. Kay finds them en route, and we have a cool flying car fight, which ends with Love's spinner skidding to a stop on the shore of the Sepulveda seawall. And with the turbulent waves crashing around them, Kay fights Love. Meanwhile, the tides are slowly dragging her spinner into the ocean where Deckard is still cuffed to his seat and unable to move. So he begins to drown. 
The fight between Kay and Love is vicious. At the start, both of them shoot each other. I think Kay gets her in the shoulder, and she shoots him in the stomach. From there, they struggle as the water continually drags at the both of them. Eventually, Love stabs him, kisses him on the mouth, and then walks away, proclaiming, I'm the best one. After that, Kay finally manages to subdue her, drowning her inside of the sinking spinner in a long and disturbing sequence. From there, he frees Deckard and gets him out of the spinner and headed for shore. There is a moment once Deckard is on land where he can't find Kay and he panics, calling out for Joe until he finds him swimming to shore and they both stagger onto solid ground. Deckard says that Kay should have let him die, and Kay says he did, that they should pretend he drowned out there. You're free to meet your daughter now. After the deafening crash of waves in the previous scene, the outside of Anna's facility is so quiet. Snow drifts gently down as the pair step out of Kay's spinner and approach the door. They both pause on the threshold, and without a word, Kay pulls out the carved wooden horse and hands it to Deckard, who takes it in shaking hands, stunned into silence. And Kay tells him, All the best memories are hers. And Deckard thinks for a moment before asking, Why? What am I to you? And he asks if Kay is okay. And Kay just smiles and nods for him to go. And so he does. And we know Kay lied, but he fulfilled what he set out to do. And so he lies down on the stairs leading to Anna's lab and seems to be at peace, feeling the gentle snowfall. And he dies. Inside the lab, we see Anna is building a memory with snow as Deckard walks inside. She says, Beautiful, isn't it? and walks over to the glass that divides them, seemingly sizing up the man before her. And an emotional Deckard wordlessly presses his hand to the glass and smiles. And that's the end of the movie. And I want to be jettisoned into the sun! I'm very sad about it! Okay, so a couple of things. First off, while the ending is technically open to interpretation, it's pretty clear what we're meant to take from it. Screenwriter Michael Green said, I was surprised to find out that anybody thought he didn't die, and I can say this, the non-casual fan might recognize the music cue that plays in that moment. It's a Vangelis track from the original film titled Tears in the Rain, from the scene when Roy Batty gives his famous speech and then dies. Also, there's this parallel that makes me insane between Kay and Anna. When Kay first goes to Anna's lab, after his whole conversation with her, when he steps outside, we get this long meditative shot of his hand, outstretched to feel the falling snowflakes. He even does it again briefly on the stairs at the end of the film, before we cut to this long shot of Anna's hand moving through the snowflakes she's creating in a memory. I just think that this parallel between Deckard's daughter and the man who thought he was his son is so heartbreaking. Even if Kay wasn't literally Deckard's son, when Deckard asks, What am I to you? And Kay doesn't say anything, I want to cry. Also, Houston, we have a spike situation on our hands. What is it with my favorite dudes upsetting me by dying on staircases? No, I will not elaborate further. Kay's story is so sad because he loses everything and seems to accept that, with saving Deckard and reuniting him with Anna, He's done enough, and it makes me so sad because I wanted him to live. I wanted him to finally get the opportunity to just be a person. It's clear that he chose this, that he's at peace with it. Otherwise, he could have said something at any point between the seawall and Anna's lab, and maybe even patched himself up a little bit or got some help from Deckard, but this world deprived him of so much agency, and it seems this was his choice. This was the ending he wanted. The thing that breaks my heart about Kay is that he wasn't what they built him to be. Clearly, he was meant to be this unthinking, unfeeling drone who would kill on command. And he did do that. But it's something that goes against his nature every time. 
If taking you in is an option, I would much prefer that to the alternative. Hampton Fancher said, K is like a technical handbook that becomes a poem because of pain. And there's something about K that reads as a little soft, a little too gentle in a way that an unfeeling universe tends to try and stamp out of a person. And so that softness gets buried deeper where maybe it will be safe. It's something I recognize in Kay, something I've seen before. People always talk about fight or flight under pressure, but some people freeze. Some people go very still, their face becoming an empty, dead-eyed mask. It's something I see this character doing a lot. He fights when he has to, runs when he has to, but his first response is to freeze up to go empty behind the eyes. I know that look, that impulse to try and make yourself smaller, to try and hide inside your own body. I know that look. I've worn that look. But it's something that was trained into Kay, because he was built to kill, whether he wanted to or not. And then he would go back for baseline tests where his every blink and breath was monitored and measured so that if he showed even the slightest hint of emotion or trauma, presumably he'd get retired just like any other replicant he put down. Kay thinks he doesn't have a soul because he was built and not born. When he's told to track down the child, he says, To be born is to have a soul, I guess. And he's told, in a way that is clearly meant to be kind and is so cruel. You've been getting on fine without one. What's that, man? A soul. Kay wants to be more than something built. He wants a soul. I would argue he had one already. Whether it was built or developed over time, he was always enough. And so was Joy. Even though Kay was told, Dying for the right cause is the most human thing we can do. I would argue that living for one is just as important and just as human. History is full of martyrs. Nobody should be in a hurry to become another one just because they think it will make them more. Joy thought that dying would make her a real girl, but she was real in all the ways that mattered. If I could say anything to them, or to any person who's a little bit too soft inside, anybody who thinks dying could make them more, I would quote the words K.A. Applegate wrote in the Elemist Chronicles, words said by a god to a dying, very human girl. You were brave, you were strong, you were good, you mattered. I would tell people like them that when Blood Black Nothing began to spin, they were human enough. That they were as beautiful as cells interlinked within cells interlinked within cells interlinked within one stem and dreadfully distinct against the dark. It's okay to not be the main character of your story. It's okay to just simply be. Rabbi Nachman of Breslov once said, The day you were born is the day God decided that the world could not exist without you. So just remember, you've always been enough. Well, hello, everybody. Just like Kay, I too live in a capitalist hellscape and need to pay bills. Ergo, this video has been brought to you by Curiosity Stream and Nebula. This video was actually available a day early on Nebula, where you can watch it without this pesky ad. The Streamy Award nominated Nebula was built by and run by creators, and it's a platform where we don't have to worry about being demonetized or the dreaded algorithm. On Nebula, you can see exclusive content from amazing creators like Princess Weeks, Jacob Geller, Jesse Gender, FD Signifier, and so many more. But what does this have to do with Curiosity Stream? Well, they're an educational platform full of documentaries and nonfiction content, so if you're feeling in the mood for some science facts after all of this sci fi, you can go check them out. I recommend the documentary How to Build a Human, which stars Gemma Chan and discusses the ethics and practicalities of robotics and artificial intelligence. I like the taste of cheese. <laughs> and if you sign up with the link below, not only do you get access to Curiosity Stream, but you'll also get Nebula for free. It's not a trial, you'll have it as long as you're a Curiosity Stream member. And for a limited time, Curiosity Stream is offering 26% off their annual plan. That's less than $15 a year for both Curiosity Stream and Nebula. You can sign up now by going to curiositystream.com slash ladynightthebrave. So click on the link in the description or go to that URL to get 26% off of Curiosity Stream and Nebula for a year. 
So thank you for sticking all the way to the end. Sorry this video took so long. There isn't a particularly good reason for it other than like, depression sure is a bitch, huh? But I hope you enjoyed this emotional exploration of 2049, even if maybe you disagreed with some of it or weren't expecting that Animorphs reference. And thanks to those patrons who've been sticking it out. I know money is tight right now. I appreciate you. So that's all for now. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.